Welcome, everybody. It's the Thursday edition of Talk Back. First half hour, as always, is brought to you by Bitterroot Motors, where they've been doing it right for more than 41 years. Also brought to you by Temp Ride Service, where you can call Team Blue, that number, 728-1111, the Mustard Seed Restaurant, and by Selway Armory, Montana's premier firearms dealer, located out on Stockyard Road, right behind Johnny Carino's on North Reserve. Check them out online at selwayarmory.com. All right. Welcome, everybody. John King's over there. I'm Peter Christian. Joining us in studio, we're doing Fire and Ice. We do this every year, and we are thrilled to have with us Eric Juliet, right? I got it right? Eric Juliet from Missoula Rural Fire and Phil Keating from Missoula City Fire. So, Phil, you're closest to the microphone. So, Thanks hi, for hi, having us. How you doing, man? It. Good. How are you this morning? Good. Excellent. Uh, now, the, uh, you guys are representatives thereof. We're here last year. What happened in last year's hockey game? Well, Missoula Rural was missing a couple other key players, but uh, for the third year in a row, Missoula City came in, came out ahead. So, now, how many years have you been doing the competition? This will be the fourth year. Okay, so the city's won every year. Yes. Now, I was thinking about this <laughs> before. It does seem a little unfair, right? Aren't there a lot more city firefighters than there are rural firefighters? There are. Yep. So. How close are these games? Are you just, like, squashing the poor oh, guys? No, no. They're super competitive. <laughs> each each game's been more and more competitive. So they're so. Almost, almost beating you, and you have almost twice as many people? Yeah. Do you feel kind of bad about that? Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm, I'm wondering, is, is after the game uh, last year, did they find some of the, the best rural uh, hockey players tied up in a closet somewhere, or what? <laughs> and then you, <laughs> some, so yeah, yeah. We put them on a plane to Jamaica for the weekend. Okay, Eric, gra- grab that mic. It's your turn. All right. So, so uh, he he just gave it. Can you give it back a little bit? Well, it was convenient that the game did get scheduled while our two best players were out of town, and it was done that way ahead of time. But uh, that's all right. We got half the guys, like you said. But we'd rather be the underdog. And every game has been competitive. We have a good time and. Uh, ready to turn things around this year all right now t- tell us the reason the reason for this event it isn't just you know because fire firefighters and hockey i think that really goes together because there's a lot of checking there's a lot of hitting there's a lot of good natured ribbing you know i mean there's all sorts of good stuff going on right it, it, it is a fun event right yeah and unfortunately we have to keep it a little cleaner than we would like <laughs> otherwise there'd be more checking going on out there but uh it's all about uh fundraising we're raising money for leukemia lymphoma uh, all the proceeds go to the Le- Leukemia Lymphoma Society and our stair climb fundraising. Uh, I will note that I do believe in total funds raised last year, Missoula Rural did beat the city. Aha. Uh-huh. So, hmm. Interesting. So it's kind of like win the battle but lose the war. Sort of thing. So there's two, yeah, there's two games going on there. Okay. And we're ready to win both this well, year. Now, because you mentioned the stair climbing thing, I forget which one of the two groups is winning in that competition. That'd be the city again. Damn. However, Rural got it started and won several years in a row before city uh, kind of jumped on the bandwagon there. there. Yeah, yeah. I was yeah. going to ask you guys about about the. I, I know we're here to talk about fire and ice, but the stair climb challenge amazes me because it always seems that somebody from Missoula, either city or rural, almost always wins that event. I mean, what is it like? You guys taking you know, special Kool-Aid over to Seattle or what? I mean, how does that work? I think that's what all the competitors think because I think it's been six years in a row now yeah. that someone from Missoula has won. Uh, I know it's not only our individuals, but uh, typically we come back with a team victory as well. And for a few years there, it was uh, number one and number two every year, city and rural, rural and city. So I don't know what it is. Nice competing against cafe coffee sipping <laughs> <laughs> oh, we play hockey to stay in shape, so that helps us out too. Now, now tell me that the the Seattle firefighters aren't carrying Starbucks up the stairs. I mean, they're 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 loaded down just like you guys are. Oh yeah, okay. yeah, same guys. I don't know what it is, but uh, we got some tough guys and and some real athletes. So they just go over there and perform. And I think part of it's uh, and it's good for the hockey game too. We're all just so competitive that we're not going to give in. You know, we're not we're not ready to lose. No, it seems to me they have the local advantage, right? They can practice running up and down the stairs all day. Uh, they actually have stairs, maybe even elevators in that highly technological wonder world known as Seattle. But over here in Montana, I mean, we have, have like one escalator, very difficult to find stairways long enough for you to practice on. So what do you do for practice? Uh, we actually go to Aber Hall. Yeah. So we've got 11 Been there. flights of stairs Been there. compared to the 72 that they've got to practice with. Interesting. So. Interesting. Okay, back to the fire and ice. Uh, tell us when and where and uh, who's going to win. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a little preview, yeah. It's funny, I had to step forward to say who was going to win. Okay. Uh, January 3rd, 
Uh, six o'clock. We're, we're actually doing some. We're having two games because it's kind of grown so much. Right. Uh, we're gonna do the first game. Will start at six p.m. at uh, Glacier Ice Rink, and it's the Urban Interface first annual. So it's Missoula City um, firefighters versus um, Missoula Wildland firefighters. Oh area wow! Smoke okay. jumpers, wildland guys, and then the the uh, Fire on Ice game against Missoula Rural will be at seven thirty. There's right. raffles, fundraisers. Well, now hold on, hold on, hold on. So, so is the first uh, is the first uh, game a mixture of your two uh, against the wildland guys, or is it just city against wildland? No, guys? because we have um, hockey's grown so much in the department. We have quite a few guys, probably thirty guys on the roster. So we took kind of broke it up into two different teams. Cool. So that we could have two competitive games. Can we beat Bozeman at the Fire and Ice tournament next year? Because I mean, it's kind of hard for me to root between city and rural because i kind of like both since you both saved my life because i'm kind of on the boundary uh but <laughs> but i would love to cheer for the other guy to lose like if we were playing against bozeman or some other city in Montana. yeah we, we've looked at doing uh you know like a fire department uh hockey tournament here in town um there's definitely some good hockey teams out there B- boise seattle has a team Huh. Okay, tell us again when, where, and is, is is there an admission charge, and that's how you make money, or is it by donation, or yeah, what? Yeah, it's, it's all by donation. It's okay. uh, January 3rd, 6 p.m. is the first game, 7.30 is the second game, at Glacier Ice Rink. Um, it's a fundraiser for leukemia lymphoma. How much, and it's free, but you're going to make, yeah, make donations. Yeah, uh, $10 donation at the door. Super. All right, well, so. well, thank you guys, and best of luck to you, to both of you, and a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thank you. Thanks right. for having us. You bet. Thanks for coming there. We're going to come right back. Uh, 721 is our number. one eight. Did you want to keep them for a while longer? No, no, that's good. Okay, because, yeah. you know. We've got Cuba to talk about. Yes, we do. We've got uh, Karma to talk about. Yeah, we'll be right back. Stay with us. Bum, 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 bum. We're back on Talk Back. Uh, 721 is the number. That's John King. I'm Peter Christian. And you are you, <laughs> whoever you may be. We hope, so. we hope so. Unless you have an identity crisis and we can't help you there. Yeah. All right, we have all three lines open, 721-1290. But you, young man, uh, doing what you always do as your wonderful producer gig, is you've come up with some really interesting stuff, uh, you know, worldwide stuff to talk yeah, about. Yeah, um, I wanted to start talking about Cuba. And Cuba. then at 830, we will talk about Marcus Karma's trial okay. and right. the decision there. So. Go ahead and play this tape from uh, Mr. Obama Here and give, set the stage. He announced yeah. this yesterday. El Presidente, uh, President Obama, talking about changing relationships with Cuba. Proudly, the United States has supported democracy and human rights in Cuba through these five decades. We've done so primarily through policies that aim to isolate the island, preventing the most basic travel and commerce that Americans can enjoy anyplace else. And though this policy has been rooted in the best of intentions, No other nation joins us in imposing these sanctions, and it has had little effect beyond providing the Cuban government with a rationale for restrictions on its people. Today, Cuba is still governed by the Castros and the Communist Party that came to power half a century ago. Neither the American nor Cuban people are well served by a rigid policy that's rooted in events that took place before most of us were born. Consider that for more than 35 years, we've had relations with China, a far larger country also governed by a communist party. Nearly two decades ago, we reestablished relations with Vietnam, where we fought a war that claimed more Americans than any Cold War confrontation. That's why, when I came into office, I promised to reexamine our Cuba policy. As a start, we lifted restrictions for Cuban Americans to travel and send remittances to their families in Cuba. These changes, once controversial, now seem obvious. Cuban Americans have been reunited with their families and are the best possible ambassadors for our values. And through these exchanges, a younger generation of Cuban Americans has increasingly questioned an approach that does more to keep Cuba closed off from an interconnected world. While I've been prepared to take additional steps for some time, A major obstacle stood in our way. The wrongful imprisonment in Cuba of a U.S. citizen and USAID subcontractor, Alan Gross, for five years. Over many months, my administration has held discussions with the Cuban government about Alan's case and other aspects of our relationship. His Holiness Pope Francis issued a personal appeal to me and to Cuba's President Raul Castro, urging us to resolve Alan's case 
and to address Cuba's interest in the release of three Cuban agents who've been jailed in the United States for over 15 years. Today, Alan returned home, reunited with his family at long last. Alan was released by the Cuban government on humanitarian grounds. Separately, in exchange for the three Cuban agents, Cuba today released one of the most important intelligence agents that the United States has ever had in Cuba and who has been imprisoned for nearly two decades. This man, whose sacrifice has been known to only a few, provided America with the information that allowed us to arrest the network of Cuban agents that included the men transferred to Cuba today, as well as other spies in the United States. This man is now safely on our shores. Okay, so there you go. That's uh, that's what's going on with President Obama and the uh, the deal with Cuba. So. Yeah, so a lot of people in uh, people are wondering why did it happen now? What whatever changed? You know, uh, right. uh, th apparently the Pope weighed in on this, um, but uh, Congress pip? was not. Did in you say pip? Zip it, <laughs> zip it. Uh, <laughs> he said pip. <laughs> you can't say that on the radio, Peter. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah. So. Um, but uh, a lot of people are wondering, well, is this just political shenanigans? Is this really going to work? Uh, what did we get out of the deal? Yeah, why obviously. now? What, I mean, what, why, what, why now? And, yeah. you know, I, I think everybody's happy that we we're, get, we're getting two individuals that were being kept in. Sure, yeah. Um, which I'm sure was a nice, torture-free environment in a communist dictatorship where yeah, they kill their own people. Right, yeah. Um, anyway, so these two prisoners have come back home. By the way, one of the funniest things... Uh, Guy gets out of Cuba after being held captive for years. Right. Comes to a New York law firm where they're working on paperwork, and someone snapped a picture of him, right? Well, guess what's on the wall of this extremely um, not conservative uh, lawyer's office? A photo of Fidel Castro. And Che Guevara. <laughs> oh, man. On the wall behind him. Wow. So it's like, wow, you can never leave. You could go to any college dorm room in America and suffer wow. the same glaring eyes. Anyway, so um, I thought that uh, w one of the things that was really interesting that came out yesterday was a very impassioned speech from Marco Rubio. Right. My personal favorite right now for president of the United States next yeah. session. Um, Marco uh, is a Cuban-American. Right. Which makes this a little bit of different weight than most other senators would be able to give it. Uh, here's his response to the announcement that we were opening up relations with Cuba. Here we go. They gain no commitment on the part of the Cuban regime to freedom of press or freedom of speech or elections. No binding commitment was made to truly open up the Internet. No commitment was made to allowing the establishment of political parties or to even begin the semblance of a transition to democracy. And in exchange for all of these concessions, the only thing the Cuban government agreed to do is free 53 political prisoners who could wind up in jail tomorrow morning if they once again take up the cause of freedom, and to allow the United Nations and the Red Cross to monitor conditions on the island. The same United Nations that did nothing when Cuba last year was caught helping North Korea evade United Nations sanctions. This entire policy shift announced today is based on an illusion, on a lie. The lie and the illusion that more commerce and access to money and goods will translate to political freedom for the Cuban people. All this is going to do is give the Castro regime, which controls every aspect of Cuban life, the opportunity to manipulate these changes to perpetuate itself in power. These changes will only lead to greater wealth and influence for this oppressive regime, especially the military, which controls most, if not all, of the Cuban economy and controls all of its oppressed people. These changes will lead to legitimacy for a government that shamelessly, continuously abuses human rights, but it will not lead to assistance for those whose rights are being abused. It is just another concession to a tyranny by the Obama administration, rather than a defense of every universal and inalienable right that our country was founded on and stands for. In short, what these changes are going to do is they will tighten this regime's grip on power for decades to come. And it will significantly set back the hopes of freedom and democracy for the Cuban people. 
Now, I am overjoyed for Alan Gross and his family. He has been a hostage of this regime who was kept against his will for far too long. Our prayers are with him and his family because he was not just a prisoner, he was a hostage. But this president has proven today that his foreign policy is more than just naive. It is willfully ignorant of the way the world truly works. This administration just last week finally agreed, after months of congressional pressure, to impose sanctions on the Venezuelan government officials who are violating human rights. A government that has spent all of 2014 appallingly killing, jailing, and violently oppressing its own people. And yet, a week later, this administration is making historic concessions to the very Cuban government that supports and is behind the tyranny in Venezuela. <laughs> The Cuban government is influential at the highest levels of the Venezuelan regime and has helped them mastermind the crackdown on the Venezuelan people. This policy contradiction is absurd and it is disgraceful for a president who claims to treasure human rights and human freedom. This president is the single worst negotiator we have had in the White House in my lifetime, who has basically given the Cuban government everything it asked for and receive no assurances of any advances in democracy and freedom in return. Wow. And this guy lived through Jimmy Carter, so he's not just... <sighs> wow. Interesting to hear, to hear the uh, viewpoint of someone who is a Cuban-American, yeah. who uh, is much closer to the situation than, you know, 99.9% .9 of us, who think, gee, now we can get cigars. You know, I mean, and if you think about it, that's what Cuba was famous for for many, many years is, is Cuban cigars. And, of course, before pre-Castro, it was uh, kind of a, like a, a southern resort where people would go. There were casinos and all sorts of things going on. Why wouldn't a government that's famous for killing people not be famous for an export that also kills people? Right. <laughs> <laughs> but so you don't really inhale cigars. So anyway, is that, that true? You just uh, that's that's what they you say. You Bill Clinton the cigar. Well, yeah. All right. All right. Well, we're going to come right back with more in a minute. Hey, thanks for joining us on uh, Talk Back. It is Thursday, December eighteenth. It's uh, twenty five minutes past the hour at eight thirty. We're going to have Gary Marbot uh, joining us this morning. That's right. Now Gary's famous for uh, Montana Shooting Sports Association, mm -hmm. also for kind of drafting Montana's Castle Doctrine and. Uh, uh, no duty to retreat right. uh, doctrines that we have in our law now. And a lot of people were wondering, Marcus Karma shouldn't have been found innocent because these laws exist. Well, we'll get the uh, view of uh, one of the drafters of those laws. And we're also going to open up the phones now. If you want to call in about anything, give us a call. 721-1290 sure. is the number. And uh, we'll get you on the air. Okay, let's get... Uh, who's on now? This is Doug? Yeah, this is Doug. Well, you don't have to go all the way to Cuba to have a good time. You can stay right here in Missoula at Christmas time because uh, they're going to lock the doors on the 24th of December. And I'm going to speak down there with a couple of my friends at 11 o'clock Christmas Day. Okay, now hold, hold, hold on a second. We, we missed the first few seconds of your message because of a little technical difficulty. So th this is Doug, right? Right. Okay, so, so tell me, tell me uh, start again. Uh, tell me what you're planning to do. Well, uh, they're going to lock up the carousel on the 24th of December. The carousel, right. Okay. And, yep, and I'm going to sneak down there with a couple of my friends on the 25th at 11 in the morning, and we're going to run the carousel, and anybody who wants to ride free could come down between 11 and 3. And you can ride as many times as you want. You can ride until you get dizzy. <laughs> or until your and, cigar goes out. So free, free Christmas carouseling. <laughs> That's right, from 11 to 3 on Christmas Day. But there's um, one problem that's going to occur on January 6th. We're going to close up the carousel for two weeks, and a bunch of us artist types are going to go down there, and we're going to repaint the ponies. Because when people are getting on and off the ponies, especially gals that have these uh, blue jeans where the back pockets have the sort of decorative rivets in them. Right. <laughs> Those things scratch the ponies when you're walking between the ponies and when you're sitting on the seat. So we have to repaint all those scratches. And uh, so that's going to take us about two weeks. Nothing worse than scratching a pony. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> and it, it just really, uh, so after two weeks, uh, when you walk in there, it's going to look like it was a brand new carousel. We're going to clean uh, every area of the carousel and also a few... Uh, want to bring your kid down, we have uh, 
Santa's pony. And uh, the kids would enjoy looking at Santa's pony with all the gifts on it and their names on all the little gifts that are uh, carved onto the, into the wood. And so uh, that's the place to go to have fun. You don't have to go all the way to Cuba. Well, now, Doug, let me ask you, is, is Santa's pony one that kids can actually ride on the carousel, or is it just on display there? It, it's on display all year long, except uh, this time of the year we put it on, and you can come down and stand beside your kid and have uh, your kid on the pony and uh, take pictures. And so uh, it's a great place to have fun. If you've never rid the carousel, you can ride it free on Christmas Day from 11 to 3. Fantastic. Right. Well, hey, thanks for calling in. Bye-bye. Merry Christmas, Doug. Merry Christmas. Thank you, sir. It's shocking to hear that ladies' pants are destroying the ponies. Maybe someone should carry a bill to the Montana State Legislature forbidding the wearing of these types of pants. Or at the very least, uh, there, <laughs> there should be a presidential, some sort of presidential uh, decree that uh, if you're going to ride exactly the carousel in Missoula, Montana, you may not have rivets on your butt. Well, <laughs> those decrees have solved so many problems so far. I Maybe know. we can work on this small thing. <laughs> you want to start small and move up. You know? <laughs> but maybe you shouldn't have started with amnesty. Should have started with rivets on the butt. And then and to see if that how that works out. And if people can abide by that, then we can just kind of move our way up to... Uh, then, and, and then after, after you solve the rivets on the butt problem, then, then you can solve one of my favorite pet peeves, which is people at convenience stores, okay, okay who don't use those pretty orange and yellow lines that are there called parking spaces to run in and get a cup of coffee or a paper or a pop or whatever. They park in the fire lane, you know, where emergency vehicles are supposed to be. And anytime you ask them about it, what do they say? I'm only going to be here for a minute. I'm only going to be here for a minute. I said... Everybody says that. What is wrong with you? Just use the parking spaces. It's a fire. It says fire lane right on it. Don't park there. Okay, so once we get that solved, then maybe we can go <laughs> We could go to amnesty after that. What do you think? We could maybe do that. <laughs> I, 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 uh, I don't see the president uh, stepping up to help you on that one. I don't think so either. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I, I bring that up sometimes to convenience store employees. And they look at me like, we have a lot of other things to worry about. Besides people parking in Someone the might rob us with a newspaper this week. <laughs> you never know. Anyway, so it, it is 8.30, and we're going to take a little break. And when we come back, uh, hopefully we're going to have Mr. Gary Marbot uh, joining us, the president of the Montana Shooting Sports Association. And as John mentioned, he is the, the gentleman who drafted the uh, 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 no, uh, no requirement to yield law uh, that is currently part, it was passed by the 2009 legislature that is commonly called Castle Doctrine or Stand Your Ground or whatever you want to call it. It was, uh, it was used primarily as a defense in the Marcus Karma trial. So we'll take a quick break and come right back. All right, talk back, rolling right along. Thanks for joining us on this Thursday, December 18th. Yesterday, of course, was the uh, the wrap-up of the Marcus Karma trial, a very emotional uh, moment in, uh, in the courtroom when Marcus Karma was found guilty of deliberate homicide by a jury of his peers in Missoula, Montana. Now, uh, the defense uh, by Mr. Paul Ryan and his uh, defense team primarily uh, was at least de- partially dependent on the fact that they felt that because uh, Mr. Day-Day was coming into their structure, their occupied structure, that they had a right to defend themselves with a deadly force. And so we wanted to get a Gary Marbot on the line right now. Good morning, Gary. How are you, sir? Good morning, Peter. Good morning, John. And good morning to your listeners. You bet. It's a pleasure to have you on. I, we appreciate uh, the fact that you're willing to spend your time with us, especially since you uh, know so much background in this subject. Well, I am uh, accepted as an expert in state and federal courts uh, concerning uh, self-defense, use of force, firearm safety, and uh, I teach those subjects to my students, uh, my self-defense students, and I've now graduated over 4,000 students from those classes. Now, Gary, if I may ask, uh, were you asked to testify by the defense? I was not. You're not? Okay. Uh, I I did want to ask... A lot of people were wondering if Montana's gun laws should have protected Marcus Karma from the guilty verdict that came down yesterday. And I wanted you to kind of analyze what you saw in the trial and what you uh, read about, along with your deep knowledge of Montana gun laws. Um, 
it's my understanding that you helped to draft uh, many of the laws that would have maybe come into play in this case. So if you could dissect some of that for us, it'd be uh, much welcome. Um, certainly. Um, <clears throat> what I tell my students is, first of all, we have to define what constitutes lethal force. Lethal force is an amount of force likely to cause serious bodily injury or loss of life. And a person is, well, not only do Montana laws allow a person to use lethal force in self-defense, but all moral codes in history have said that if you're at risk for loss of life or serious bodily injury, you may use lethal force to defend yourself up to and including taking another human life if necessary. So that's what Montana law says, is that you are authorized to use lethal force if you truly believe that you are at risk for serious bodily injury or loss of life. There's been a lot of discussion about the Castle Doctrine in Montana. And the Castle Doctrine really doesn't allow any use of force greater than that. So you can, um, that amount of force is allowed inside your home or outside of your home. Um, and there's really, the Castle Doctrine doesn't make much difference. And the um, term Castle Doctrine doesn't really apply very well in Montana. The statute in Montana is called Defense of an Occupied Structure. And it says that if you're in an occupied structure <clears throat> and a person, another person has made and uh, is there illegally um, and you are at risk for uh, loss of life or serious bodily injury, you can use lethal force. Now, it's never that simple, of course. <clears throat> and I tell my students that if they should defend themselves using lethal force, they will be asked to explain later to investigators and to the prosecutors and to the coroner's jury and ultimately to a trial jury <clears throat> how they were, uh, how would they justify that they felt that they were at risk for serious bodily injury or loss of life. And the ways that they would be asked to justify that is to <clears throat> be able to explain that their alleged assailant um, uh, was ha had three um, qualities. Number one, opportunity. Number two, ability. Number three, intent. Opportunity means that the assailant was within striking distance and able to actually deliver the harm. <clears throat> Suppose somebody's 100 yards away from you and throwing rocks at you and call you name, calling you names. That person really doesn't have the opportunity because he, he can only throw rocks 30 yards. <clears throat> ability means a disparity of force, armed with a weapon, um, surprise, multiple attackers, or whatever, but some way that the harm can actually be delivered. And intent means <clears throat> that the person does something to demonstrate that they really have intent to do you harm, uh, some verbalization, or they're attacking you and charging at you, or something like that. Suppose you were on the street and you saw somebody walking down the street 15 feet away with a holstered handgun. That person has opportunity. That person has ability. But they have no intent. You can't just shoot them dead and say, gosh, I thought he was going to do something to me. <clears throat> so all of those three things have to be present in order to justify the use of lethal force. Now, real quick, uh, Gary. Yes. It seems to me that in the karma case, a, a lot of this is literally wrapped in darkness and shadow because... Deeran was in the garage, and the argument from the defense was he didn't know what was in there. He didn't know if they had ability. He didn't know if he had uh, intent. He didn't know what was, you know, what was going to happen. But, but the argument is that he heard some shuffling, and then he heard what he perceived, according to testimony, was metal on metal. And so he, in his mind's eye, was thinking, is it a wrench? Is it a gun? Is it a knife? I, I, and so he, he fired. So... I'm wondering, when you hear that testimony, what goes through your mind? Well, let me complete my description of, Please, of how yeah. a person would have to justify um, their, uh, the, you know, that their attacker was a legitimate attacker. Tell you, well, let, let, let's do this first. We're up against a break, and I want to give you plenty of time to, to be able to complete your answer. So we'll come right back. Uh, Gary Marba joining us in studio. We're, we're uh, d dissecting, if you will, um, the, the actual doctrine that uh, he helped to, uh, to draft for the Montana legislature that is now Montana law, and we're comparing that to what actually happened in the uh, Marcus Karma case. So we'll be right back with more with Gary Marbot in just a moment.
Hey, thanks for joining us on TalkBack. It is Thursday, December the 18th. is the day after the uh, guilty verdict, deliberate homicide with uh, Marcus Karma. And uh, Gary Marbot, uh, attorney and uh, a drafter of many bills in the Montana legislature. Now, we interrupted you right in the middle of a very important explanation, Gary, so please continue. Okay, but let me qualify. I'm not an attorney. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. So anyway, I told you that a, a person to justify their use of lethal force must be able to explain that their alleged assailant had opportunity, ability, and intent. Okay. And, and the next step is all of those things have to be imminent and real. They cannot be imaginary. They can't be hypothetical. They can't be sometime half an hour down the road in the future, and a person is just taking preventative action. Then fine, and those uh, uh, the imminence has to apply to all three of those: opportunity, ability, and intent. And then finally, <clears throat> as a person responds, their response should be proportional to the threat. Okay, those are the standards that will be looked at. So, um, back to your question um, about what happened um, in the Karma incident. Um, I think John's point is very well taken that the illumination in the garage is a very critical factor. Um, if Karma could not have visualized his alleged assailant, how could he have qualified that uh, his assailant had opportunity, ability, or intent? And how could he have uh, determined that all three of those were imminent? Well, he couldn't, obviously. Obviously. And I think the jury figured that out. So, so you think that the, the guilty verdict is justified, even with I, Montana's laws? I do, I do. And I think um, from the reporting that I saw about the trial, um, I was a little surprised that the prosecution didn't um, spend more time on the issue of the level of illumination in the garage. Because to my mind, that's what the case turned on. I mean, they spent a lot of time, according to what I heard and read, um, talking about thinking about premeditation and and uh, um, you know, that kind of stuff, but they didn't look as closely as I would have at the question of the level of illumination. Well, speaking of, speaking of illumination, uh, one of the screenshots that was captured uh, that was shown, as a matter of fact, we've had it on our website many times, uh, is a picture of Mr. Dede in the garage holding some sort of a cell phone or light source that, that cast just a little bit of a glow. I'm assuming it's a cell phone, you know, like, a, like a light from a cell phone, okay? And, however, when Mr. Karma went out to confront, either that was turned off or hidden somehow, and it was pitch black in there. Well, so. and also, apparently, the wife of Janelle Flager right, right. turned on the lights, and so if you're out in the dark and the lights come on, you can see even worse, probably, than if there wasn't light, because your, you know, your iris has to change, or your right. pupil dilates. Right, and uh, um, <clears throat> as I recall hearing, there was some question about when the lights were turned on. Well, according to the testimony in, in the closing, uh, the the light came on. Just you know, karma came out of the out of the front door into the front of the garage, and almost immediately, the outdoor lights in the garage were flipped on. So he was blinded by that bright light, trying to gaze into an already dark garage. So it was, if you will, it was doubly blind. Okay. There were some other problems with the whole scenario. Um, for example, there was a tactical problem. He alleged that he was concerned about the safety of his wife and child. Right. And so he went out to outside and blocked the only uh, exit the only way that the alleged assailant could escape and theoretically, tactically um, forced him to go into the house. I mean, that was his only escape route left, was to go through that passage door and into the house to the point where um, his, his family were theoretically at risk. And how much tactical sense does that make? Hmm. Interesting. I, I wanted to know, um, one of the things that came up during this whole trial is, um, well, in fact, I saw it yesterday. I tried to get her on the show. Ellie Hill, uh, who I'm friends with on Facebook, had posted um, that uh, Montana's vigilante gun culture took a hit with the decision yesterday. And I saw other people making comments. Uh, I'll bring up one because it mentioned you specifically, Gary. 
that the blood of many people is on your hands and on uh, Creighton Kearns' hands because of the gun laws that we have in Montana. And there's people out there that think that our gun laws have created a culture where people think it's okay to shoot people and kill people um, under you know circumstances. And I wanted to get your take. How do you how do you deal with that? How do you confront that and support the gun laws? Well, that's just the hype used by somebody who claims to support the Second Amendment who has no real knowledge about the Second Amendment or um, this whole area. Um, just as an aside, um, three different times I allowed Ellie Hill to register to attend one of my classes um, so that she could learn about this stuff. And three different times she was a no-show. She failed to show up. And not only did she fail to show up and learn what she should have learned, but she also wasted a slot in my class that some other student would like to have had in order to learn about these things. <clears throat> so um, if we look at Montana culture, we understand that Montana is a pretty gunny place. We have lots of guns. And if guns cause crime, then we would be awash in crime, but we're not. We have relatively low crime stats. <clears throat> One of the reasons for that is when kids grow up in Montana, they grow up around guns, and they learn about our gun culture. They learn to uh, be responsible about firearms, to handle them safely, to avoid them you know, when, when they're supposed to, and to not misuse them. That is a part of our life and a part of our culture. Um, we do, I admit, get people who um, <clears throat> blow in from other places and do not have that cultural background. Um, who may think that they've moved into a place where they can do whatever they want. Um, but that's just not true. Those of us who grow up here um, um, learn as a part of our culture that firearms are, can be dangerous, that they have to be um, stored properly and handled responsibly and used responsibly. That's why over 4,000 people have taken my classes in order to make sure that they understand all of that. Okay, now if, if we can, and, and I don't mean to trivialize all that went on in the last couple of weeks, okay, but if we could make this a teaching moment, all right, and, and you're advising someone who is in their home and they hear somebody in their garage and they have a weapon, what is, in, in your view, someone who's been trained in your classes, what is the best way to handle that situation from your point of view? to call 911. If nobody's life is at risk at that point, there's no justification for using the lethal force. There may be a crime being committed, but uh, it's much better to let the police handle it if that's possible. If you're in a place in a rural area <coughs> where police time, response times might be an hour or two, um, the situation changes. But in the example of in Missoula, then obviously you may want to barricade yourself in a strong room and be prepared to defend that strong room. <clears throat> um, but uh, the, the dealing with that kind of uh, petty crime is really a job for the police. Yeah, and really, to me, I, I had written on our Facebook page that I thought that they would find him guilty a couple days ago. I also thought that they would be a appeal for a, a change of venue, which also happened. It seems to me that this was a long time coming. One of the things that I found so striking about this case was the fact that Janelle never called 911 until after a boy was dead in her garage. Right. Which, it, you know, if you're really thinking self-defense, if you're really thinking what's best for me and my family and protecting the, that, that household, yeah, sure, I might grab my gun as the, the, I might go out there, but I'm certainly going to tell my wife to call 911 immediately. Right. Now, we're, we're going to come, come right back. Gary Marbot's going to stay with us for a little while. Uh, Dave will get you on right after this quick commercial break. Stay with us. And our short segment here before the top of the hour, Gary Marba joining us uh, this morning, president of the Montana Shooting Sports Association. But let's uh, let's get Dave on the line who has a question for you. Uh, Dave, you're on with Gary Marba. Go ahead. Actually, I've got three. <clears throat> oh, the okay. first is for Gary. Okay. And the other two from who, whomever wants to answer them. Okay? All right. Uh, first of all, um, I believe that the county attorney, uh, Van Valkenburg, when he was in the state legislature, in the state senate, uh, voted against several of the laws that Gary Morbitt proposed. Okay, uh, I wonder if he knows how. If he knows that, um, I do know that um, he was uh, pretty reliably an anti-gun vote um, in the legislature. But without researching my records, I couldn't tell you which items he uh, he opposed. 
Maybe we could find that out somehow. I don't even have a computer. Well, so I, the well, I, I have the records, but it would take some digging, and that's probably not germane right now. And we have two minutes, gentlemen. Go ahead. Okay. We will have the a next, new county attorney soon. The next soon. question is, uh, why didn't uh, Karma have the advantage or disadvantage of a coroner's jury inquest like the Fox Club shooting? I don't know. Well, it's a decision based on, I mean, they don't have to have a coroner's inquest. That's an extra step they can choose to make. If we had grand juries, there wouldn't be a choice, would there? And finally, uh, karma appears to me to be oriental in extraction. I he's, wonder if that plays a part a, in his conviction. He's, he's of Korean descent. Uh-huh. What, are you saying that you think the Montana jurors were racist and wanted to put away him? Possibly. Because he's a Korean? Are you kidding me? Well, come on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Come on. Yeah, come on. I don't see I, it. I, I, I don't believe that for a second, Dave. Well, I do. Okay. Well, we disagree <laughs> then. Well, okay. I, I, Thanks for calling. <laughs> I think he was found guilty because all the evidence pointed to that. Yeah. So, but. That's and I think, let me close this segment by saying, um, I think juries uh, historically do a very good job of sorting out the facts and making correct decisions. And I really, really applaud this jury for sitting through a lot of tedious and some gruesome testimony and coming to what I believe was the right conclusion. Well, I, I will say, I, I, as I literally stood right beside the jury box for the 99.9% uh, .9 of the trial, and uh, every single juror was... Uh, paying very close attention to, to the prosecution and the defense. They took notes. They, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure during deliberations, they, they, they wanted to look at more evidence. They looked again and again and again at various things before they came to that. that and it had to be uh, a unanimous uh, verdict, uh, or either that or it would have been a, uh, an acquittal. Do you, you, did, you know they, they, the last day they watched those films and looked at that video again? Right. Do you know if they were considering how dark it was in the garage? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I, and again, we, we're not allowed to talk to the jury until today. And, of course, uh, a lot of the folks who were on the jury did not really want to talk to the press in the first place. So anyway, we're, we're going to take a, a quick break, come right back, and we appreciate uh, Gary Marba joining us. We'll be right back with more of Talk Back after this time out, the top of the hour news. All right, it's Thursday, and it's the day following the uh, guilty verdict for Marcus Karma for deliberate homicide and the death of a 17-year-old German exchange student here in Dede. Uh, joining us on the telephone is the president of the Montana Shooting Sports Association, uh, Gary Marbot. We've been uh, talking about this for the last half hour, so go ahead, John. Yeah, I was just going to give the opportunity to our callers. Give us a call if you want to talk to Gary or put in your own two cents on the Karma trial. By calling 721-1290. Uh, Florence has already done that. We're going to go to her call right now. Uh, Florence, you're on with Mr. Marbot. Go ahead, ma'am. Yes, um, all I have to say is if you have a um, high-profile uh, case here in Missoula, God help you. Why is that? This guy didn't have a snowball's chance in hell with all the uh, pre-trial coverage. They should have moved the trial to Bozeman, Butte, anywhere but here. Well, they, they asked. Twi I think at least twice yeah, to get twice. a change of venue. And, and the uh, judge said no, because I think the, everybody already had their mind made up. Well, I think he didn't have a stonewall's chance in hell. Let me ask you this, Florence. Do you think mm -hmm. that the evidence that came out during the, the court case could be read the other way to prove his innocence? I didn't pay much attention to it because everything was out before the trial. Okay, well, that, that being said, I mean, sometimes that happens. Sometimes a, a news story is so big that everyone in the world knows. So let, let's just backtrack a little bit. It sounds to me that okay. you're saying that he was put away and he was innocent and that he didn't get a fair trial. I didn't trial. say that. Well, I didn't say that. So you don't think, he got, but you don't he think he got a, a fair, fair trial. trial? He just needed a fair trial. Do you think that there's and a court? I don't think he got it here in Missoula. Do you think there's a... I think he was guilty, but okay. you could shoot once, but not four times. He didn't need to shoot him four times, no. Well, okay. Yeah. Okay, well, Florence, thanks for the call. Appreci appreciate your, your input there. So, uh, Gary, uh, your, your response to it, Florence, uh, do, do you believe that, uh, I, I mean, believe it or not, I mean, it's a matter of opinion whether uh, 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 Mr. Karma got a, a fair trial in Missoula or not. So um, uh, how about you? It's interesting. She says she thought that the outcome was right, but it was arrived at unfairly. <laughs> that kind of got me pondering what, how that could be so. But, um, you know, there's a long history in America of trying to um, reach fair trials. Um, really, the uh, judicial history began with a case, I think, in the 50s in Nebraska, where a deranged guy murdered a whole family, and they found him in a cornfield out behind the house, and, and the press was 
was making was printing lurid stories about it, and uh, the um, the, the at, uh, defense request the judge gagged the press, and that went to the courts. Um, the Nebraska Press Association brought a suit and said you can't gag the press. And what they finally uh, got to was that that's, that that would be a last resort. That first, the other things had to be done. This is, jury had to be sequestered. Jury had to be um, ordered not to read the paper. The public officials had to be ordered not to talk to the press. Um, and uh, then there's always uh, sequestering the jury or moving the trial, and all of those things had to be attempted before the um, judiciary would dare gag the press. So there's a lot of history on this kind of um, this question in America. Uh, the call right be uh, uh, I think it was Florence actually that mentioned the or it was actually right before the hour. He talked about sh- getting uh, shooting four bullets. If you're shooting to kill. And everything is justified up to that point. Does it matter how many times you shoot? I mean, there's a lot of people that think that you should only shoot to wound or something like that, but that doesn't seem like a very safe doctrine to have in the heat of the moment. No, there, there's really no case law on that and no uh, statutory law that controls that. <clears throat> what I teach my students is if you are genuinely at fear for loss of life or serious bodily injury and you have to shoot in self-defense, you shoot until the threat is stopped. That's the job of the defender, is to stop the threat. Not to kill anybody, but to stop the attack. And But if, but if you can't see... But if you can't who, see, who, then... Yeah, who or where the person is, that I, it makes it tough. So basically, I, if I'm reading um, Gary's point so far, is that karma was at fault long before he shot four shots. Uh, at the point where he... Well, I guess when he shot the first shot, he was at fault. Right, because he could not visualize could not see his target. And, and one of the principles for gun owners is that a gun owner is responsible for where his bullet lands when he pulls the trigger. And suppose that escaped the garage and went next door and injured somebody else. Um, he well, would have been responsible actually, for that. Actually, the, the buck shot did escape the garage and ended up in the pantry uh, in, in, inside the house. Mm-hmm. So let's, uh, let, let's get, to the, uh, get to John. John, you are on with Gary Marvin. Go ahead, sir. Hi, guys. Um, you know, actually, I kind of, I don't know if you guys see it this way, but, you know, I'm looking on the news, like on Yahoo, and it says, man guilty despite stand-your-ground defense. I, I see it completely different. I see that the stand-your-ground is going to be, you know, the law that we depend on. Um, in this case, the law works. Um, and I don't see stand-your-ground or any of those doctrines, or, you know, the other doctrines they're talking about being hurt in the next legislature, because what do they have to stand on? So so do I mean, you see, so are you saying you see the laws strengthened because they absolutely. they read them carefully? Absolutely. They, you know, this, this guy tried to use, um, you know, stand-your-ground. It didn't apply, and I don't see there's any way that the law, you know, um, even with Ellie or any of the others that are trying to uh, tear it down, I think their case at the legislature coming up has just been weakened by this guilty plea. John, I absolutely agree with you and was thinking the same thing. Oh, thanks for the call, sir. Appreciate it. Hey, okay, so, that. gentlemen, that leads me into a little discussion about the laws that MSSA changed in 2009 that may apply to this. Tell you what, can we do it? Can we, we take a quick break and we'll come right back because, I, again, I, I know this is going to be a lengthy explanation. I want to make sure I don't cut them off. So, we'll, we'll take a quick break. Catherine is on the line. We have a line open for you. Gary Marbot, kind enough to spend uh, some of his very valuable time with us, president of the Montana Shooting Sports Association, as we're clarifying a lot of the issues that uh, came up during the Marcus Karma trial and how they affect us here in Montana. We'll be right back. This is Talk Back for Thursday, and uh, I'm Peter Christian. That's John King. We're kind of talking about the Marcus Karma trial that wrapped up yesterday with a guilty verdict. Uh, Gary Marba joining us this morning, president of the Montana Shooting Sports Association and a man who has authored and drafted several bills that have passed the Montana legislature. Now, you were just getting into an explanation, Gary, and I rudely interrupted, so please go ahead. That's okay. So in 2009, there were three laws that were affected by our self-defense bill, at least three laws that were in play in the Karma trial. Stand your ground, castle doctrine, and um, burden of proof. And so let me go through those one at a time and explain how they did or didn't, the changes did or occurred and didn't apply. Um, Stand your ground means that that you have no duty to run away, uh, to jump out the bathroom window, or to call police before you defend yourself if you have a legitimate need um, to defend yourself. 
Well, that had always been the case in Montana. It was in case law. It was always been assumed and understood. Um, it was part of our culture. And we thought we should just put it into statute to make sure that we didn't get any creep of the alternative into Montana. So uh, the putting stand your ground into the law in Montana was not a change. It was not nothing, anything new. It just merely confirmed what had been our culture and our, and our standard forever. Now, Gary, real quick, uh, I've heard from you that the motivation behind that change was a decision from a justice uh, in the case of a, a spouse abuse situation that went the other way. Well, we're going to get there. Oh, okay, sorry. That has to do with the burden of proof. And since you brought it up, we'll go there next and do the Castle Doctrine last. Um, There was a case out of Bozeman, the Longstreth case, where a woman who had been serially abused by a boyfriend, been hospitalized three or four times because of abuse, in the final situation, um, was defending herself, retreated into the kitchen, grabbed a knife, and her boyfriend ran onto it, and it stabbed him and uh, cut his subclavian artery, and he bled to death and died. In the, she was charged with homicide. And uh, in the trial, the judge told the jury that, it, that the defendant had to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that she was justified in using force. That is, she was basically guilty until proven innocent. Wow. That's what the judge told the jury. And uh, because there were no witnesses, she couldn't prove that she was justified in using force. So that she was convicted. It was appealed to the Montana Supreme Court, and the jury instructions were argued there, and the Montana Supreme Court agreed um, with the district court judge and upheld those jury instructions, which changed Montana law dramatically from innocent until proven guilty to guilty until proven innocent. So we went to the legislature and revised that and put it back the way it had been before the Longstreth decision, the way it is in almost every other state and the way it is in all the federal courts. So the law for the karma trial says that if uh, self-defense is asserted, then it is the duty of the burden of the prosecutor to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the accused was not justified in using lethal force. And even though that did switch around the long stress standard, the prosecutor in this case was able to meet that burden, and it's an appropriate burden for the prosecutor. Now, okay. may I ask, does the fact that the legislature changed the law, does that give any remedy to the woman who was convicted? Can, can she go back and appeal on behalf of the fact that there's a new law? Generally not. Generally the laws are considered not to be retroactive. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So back to the Castle Doctrine, or on to the Castle Doctrine, which I said before is, is not a good um, identifier because the law in Montana is defensive and occupied structure. It doesn't say Castle Doctrine. But it's an old, uh, it's an old subject in law. Um, it's been reported that I created the Castle Doctrine in Montana, and that's simply not true. The Castle Doctrine uh, first appears in the 1300s in uh, Central Europe and goes from there into the English common law and from there into the American common law in the, in the founding period of America. And then it was first in the Montana law in what we call the Bannock Statutes, the statutes of Montana's territorial days. Um, this doctrine of your home is your castle is there. So um, what does it allow and what change do we make in 2009? Well, there's some old and archaic language in there. It says that in order to avail oneself of the Castle Doctrine authority, that um, an intruder had to make an entry in a riotous and tumultuous manner. Well, riotous and tumultuous are not words of legal art. They're not defined in the code. Therefore, nobody can know exactly what they mean. And we think that people ought to be able to understand the law in order to be able to comply with it. And if you can't understand it, it's not a good law, and people shouldn't be held to a standard that, that is not understandable and is not defined. So we took those, those words out of the law in order to clarify um, that you don't have to rely on that standard of riotous and tumultuous entry to avail uh, yourself of the Castle Doctrine authority. And then the Castle Doctrine, I said, really doesn't allow any uh, use of force that's not authorized otherwise in other sections of the law. For example, it says you can use in, in your home, you can use force to prevent a forcible felony. Well, that's all, also authorized in a separate section of the code. Um, and you don't have to run away. That's a stand your ground. That's a separate section of the code. Um, you can use lethal force if you believe you're at risk for loss of life or serious bodily injury. That's also elsewhere in the Montana laws. So the Castle Doctrine really doesn't give any elevated authority, um, notwithstanding what Ellie Hill says about 
shoot first and ask questions later. Um, it, uh, that's why she should have taken my class, if she would have learned that the Castle Doctrine really doesn't offer any authority other than what is already codified in other areas of Montana law. All right, let's, let's go to phones. You bet. Let's get uh, Catherine on the line. Catherine, we have about two minutes before a break, so go ahead. Okay, well, I was just wondering, um, it was very ev- evident from the testimony that there was premeditation and baiting with the statements of uh, both of the people, Karma and his partner, uh, beforehand in setting up the situation. So I'm curious, um, and I don't know if Gary can answer this at all, but why hasn't the partner been charged as an accessory to this crime? And I really can't answer that question. That's really up to the um, prosecutors to make that determination. And uh, so a person would have to hear from them about uh, whether or not they felt that was something they should do and could get a conviction on. Well, Catherine, I am going to be interviewing uh, Andrew Paul later on today as the, the chief prosecutor of the case. I'll ask him. Okay, uh, good. Thank you. I, uh, I'm with you, Catherine. It seems to me that uh, actually most of the missteps that I found the most egregious were not karmas. They were Mrs. Flager's. Exactly. Exactly. She was the one that opened her mouth and was saying all these things to all these people. So, you know. Well, and, and she was the one who didn't call 911 until right. after he was dead. And I'll be honest, the way that I read that is, okay, we're going to wait until after the situation to include the police. Yeah. That's we were vigi- talking that's- about this off, off, off the air a couple minutes ago, and let me point out that she was not the one who pulled the trigger. Correct. She may right, be an but- accessory. She may have some, some guilt associated with it, but it, there's no law in Montana that says you have to call 911. I agree it would have been smart in this in this circumstance, to call 911, and I would recommend that people do that. But it's not required under the law. Fair, fair, fair enough, right. Gary. But if I design a route for you to go and rob Walmart, but I don't do it myself, I have you go do it for me, I'm an accessory to that, I'm an accessory to that crime. And a lot of the things that it seems that Janelle did, she's the one who had the cameras in there. She's the one who had the purse. She's the one who had the cell phone in it. A lot of the things that were involved in this case seem to be a brought about by her doing, not karma's. He was just the guy with the gun. Well, but he was he is a, um, a, a rational individual and supposedly capable of making decisions for himself, and he's the one who made the decision to pull the trigger and rack the slide and pull the trigger three more times. Right. I agree. He's guilty of deliberate homicide. I just think she's also guilty. It's not a, it's not a, no, a I, zero-sum I, game. And I don't think you can go back after the fact and start making up. Oh, no, but they can they can charge her with something. Well, 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 sure. well whether or not she's guilty would be up right. to a jury. Sure. Um, one yeah. would sure. say that maybe she has some culpability yeah. um, for the for the incident. But uh, yeah. guilt and innocence are something that are determined by a jury. Okay, Catherine, we're up against a right. break. Thanks. Have, okay, thanks for the call. And uh, we ha- we'll have Norm on in just a moment. And uh, again, we appreciate uh, Gary Marbot's time with us this morning as we break all this down and, and get some, uh, some much-needed answers uh, from what people have been talking about almost constantly for the last last couple of weeks, ever since the trial got underway. We'll be right back. Talk back for this Thursday, December 18th. Hi, Peter Christian. John King is joining us on the telephone. Is uh, Gary Marbot, president of the Montana Shooting Sports Association. And the uh, phone lines are humming, so let's get as many calls in as we can to visit with uh, Mr. Marbot. Uh, Norm, good morning. You're on with Gary Marbot. Go ahead. Good morning, gentlemen. Um... Carrie, or Candy, she just stole my thunder, most of it. Um, the I mean, one Catherine, thing I yeah. wanted to yeah. say something about was that, um, okay, they, they haven't prosecuted this uh, accomplice to the crime, but you've also, they've had the two other guys have stepped forward that were the original guys doing the break-in, and no charges have been gone, you know, put against those guys for the thing, and it's an open case. Yes, that's St- Staber and Martin. Pardon? Staber and Martin are the two individuals who are both in jail, yeah. Okay, yes. Yeah. So uh, they have been arrested? Oh, yes. They, 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 they've been in jail. They're, they have been jailed. They, they have uh, been, uh, they, they are facing burglary charges. Okay. Well, then that's good to know that justice is going on because I kind of felt this was a witch hunt for the gun control thing between Ellie and the prosecutor, like everybody's been talking about, you know. And then and, and where I come from in Florida, the law is a little bit different. Um, but, uh, you know, there's accountability, and whenever you're committing, you're in the commission of a crime, uh, you're responsible for whatever happens out of that crime. Okay. Well, thanks, Norm. Thank you. Thanks. Any comments on that, Gary? 
No, I uh, just to say that uh, prosecutors have pretty broad discretion in Montana about what they prosecute and what they don't, and uh, often we agree with them, sometimes we don't, but that's why we elect our county attorneys. So if uh, if we disagree hotly, we can always throw the rascal out of the next election. All right, let's get back to the phone. Christine, you are on with Gary Marbot. Go ahead. Hi, guys. Um, give me a sec. I'm going to try to get through this without breaking down. But okay. okay. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank Gary Marbot. Um, I took his handgun for uh, for women class years and years and years ago, and I actually have used my firearm in defense of myself since that class. And so I wanted to thank him. Um, and um, I followed this case uh, cautiously um, because I am actually in the middle of a similar case. Um, last year, uh, my brother was, my little brother was shot and killed, um, in his home in the middle of a family dispute, and, um... Where was this, Christine? Was it here in Missoula? No, my, uh, my family's from California. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. It go was ahead. out in California. Okay. And, um, my father is the shooter. Um, oh. there was extenuating circumstances all over the place you know i mean i'm not going to go into the whole details of the trial um but he is claiming self-defense and is fighting the charges in court and our you know our family is sitting through the trial starts in a couple of weeks well this whole thing's tearing your family apart i'm sure um there are definitely sides drawn um and i've actually been disowned by a few family members because i think my dad should go to jail and um, so I watched carefully um, what has gone down in the Fox Club shooting and this other shooting because Montana gun laws are certainly more on the side of gun owners than California's. And, um, but I was concerned when the Fox Club guy got off because that one seemed weird to me because he could have left. And so I was, I was a little worried that, you know, my dad might get out, you know, from this. So I, I, watched, I, I watched the Karma case, and um, I have to say I agree with the decision because of the not verifying his target, the baiting, the, you know, there was a lot to it that just seemed like, hey, this wasn't self-defense. And so I feel better today knowing that you know, juries can see that stuff. All right. Thanks, and, Chris. Um, but I will say, it has not shaken my faith in God, nor my belief in gun rights, and my belief that people should have the right to defend themselves. And that's when you know that you're standing on morality ground when you don't allow a situation that hits this close to home shake your belief system. All right. Well, Christine, thanks for your call. Please let us know how it comes out, okay? I will. Thank thanks. you. All right, let's get Harry on the line. Harry, uh, real quickly, you're on with Gary Marbot. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, good morning. I, I agree with most of what uh, Gary's been saying and the laws that, you know, the Castro Doctrine. The only thing in the Castro Doctrine I find questionable, I think it would, the law would be better without it, is the, the uh, forcible felony uh, aspect, because that seems rather legalese and rather vague. And it can be, you know, drawn into uh, a lot of you know, gray, you know, a lot of uh, stuff that is not really definable. And so, I think the law would be better without it. Just if you're, if you feel your life is threatened, or your family life is threatened, or you, or you know, something like that is more clear and it's not so vague. Well, uh, let's ask Gary. Gary, what is uh, d the definition of a forcible felony? Forcible felonies are defined in the law. Um, they're things like kidnapping and assault and um, and attempted homicide. Um, so um, there are some other forcible felonies. I'm not, I'm not uh, ready to cite the whole definition to you, but that means. Um, but but I would point out that you, the ability to use lethal force to prevent a forcible felony um, is not only in the Castle Doctrine law; it's also elsewhere in Montana statutes. So if a person thinks that it's not proper to use, uh, be able to use force to prevent kidnapping, for example, or assault that could lead to murder then it needs to be fixed not only in the Castle Doctrine Law, defense of an occupied structure, but the other place that it is present in the Montana statutes as well. Harry, yeah. thanks. Uh, go, go ahead. 
just that. Uh, but the, like, say, there's many more. You know, other words you don't know about. So I mean, a person at home or isn't going to sit there and read the uh, you know the code and say, well, I I can do it in this case, but I can't do it in that case. I mean, you know, it's just it's one of those legalities that you know you just. Uh, Lawyers games with well, uh, all laws are pretty much like well. That. And, and yeah. if I remember correctly, when I visited with Bill Fulbright about this, uh, because they had a case, similar case up in or a case of uh, a man defending his home up in Ravalli County, he said when he went through the the entire statute that you helped to write, Gary, the mm-hmm. word reasonable is in there a lot, right? It is. And there's mm-hmm. is there for a reason? Mm-hmm. That's a reasonable man right. standard. Well, thanks, Harry. So I tell you what, we're up against a break, and I know that you have lots of other media folks that are trying to get in touch with you, Gary, and we appreciate the uh, time you've given us today. Okay, so let me just say in closing that, uh, that I think that the Karma trial demonstrates that Montana gun laws work, and they work like they're supposed to, and that we've had the, an appropriate outcome from this whole thing. I also want to say that uh, I think everybody knows there were no winners here. There were no winners in the incident. There were no winners in the trial. Everybody lost something, and that's why I tell my students, if there is a tactically viable way to not use lethal force, it's always better to not use it than to use it. Because you can't take it back. Yep. All right. Gary, thanks so much. Okay. Appreciate your time and your expertise. That's uh, Gary Marvitt. So, Chuck, hang on the phone. We're going to take a break, and we have two lines open. We're going to continue this discussion. I mean, uh, we're just really getting rolling. If there's something that really bothered you about the trial, something that impressed you about how the jury was able to discern uh, one thing from another, but it, do you disagree with the verdict? Do you think that he should have been found not guilty? Uh, and if you'd like to explain why, we'd love to hear from you. Our number is 721-1290, and we're going to come right back after this time out. Thursday edition of Talk Back rolling right along. And again, uh, we, uh, unfortunately, we couldn't keep Gary all the way till 10 o'clock. He's been uh, deluged with uh, requests for media interviews regarding uh, uh, after the trial, after the verdict. Uh, yesterday, the guilty verdict of Marcus Karma of deliberate homicide. And we appreciate the hour that he spent with us. So let's get back to the phone. And everybody wants to make a comment here. Let's get Chuck on the line. Good morning, Chuck. Yeah, thanks for the great show, great guests, and you guys always do a good job. Thank you, sir. And you are what is missing from the whole conversation. We have a law passed that thousands, tens of thousands of people, gun owners, have made up their own mind what it means without ever reading it. Right. Without ever trying to understand it. And this guy, you could just look at him, and he felt so justified to kill this person because this person took his bag of marijuana, and if he sets up a trap, the castle law allows him to do that. It doesn't. Yeah. And, and it's just really fascinating that there isn't more education about what some of these severe laws mean. Well, I, I, and, I, and, and again, please, when I make a comment like this, I am not trying to trivialize what happened, okay? But if Mr. Karma and Janelle Flager had taken the time in the two years that they've been here in Missoula to take... Gary Marbot's class or a class from any other, you know, qualified gun instructor, this whole incident might never have happened, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, if, if wishes were horses, beggars could ride that, that sort of thing, it would have, could have, it, it didn't work out that way, but wouldn't it have been nice, uh, it, at least now, as, as Gary mentioned, this, this is a teaching moment. I mean, if you really want to learn what gun laws are all about, go to an expert, take a class and find out. Right. It, I mean, exactly. But our government should be doing a little bit more to say, look, folks, it isn't as clear as what you think. My uh, coffee shop review or survey, whatever you want to call it, there's all kinds of people that think he was totally justified for going on this person's possibly property to be shot and killed. Well, let me put it this way. Should should Darren Dede have walked into somebody else's garage looking for whatever he was looking for? Of course not. Okay. Yeah. He, he was committing a crime. He was, was he breaking and entering? Was he trespassing? Was he uh, in the act of burglarizing? We don't know. Uh, but, but we do know that he shouldn't have been in there. Okay. Well, we big, know he was doing some of those things. Yeah, big, big mistake. You know, uh, b- bad on him. But uh, as the prosecution said, did he deserve to be executed for walking into somebody else's garage? Well, thanks again for the great show. You bet. Thank you. Thanks for the call. Uh, Mike, you're on TalkBack. Hi. Yeah. Oh, you talking to me there? Yes, yes, Mike. You're Mike. Okay, yeah, well, I only got a, a couple quick, uh, one quick comment, really. It looks to me what you take away from this is when you are being burglarized, your garage, your car, no matter what it is, 
you, it should be a state law that says you have to offer them plastic or paper to take away your loot because you certainly cannot protect your private property with deadly force anymore. This is what's come. This is what you're going to take away from this. Well, I, I don't understand your position here, Mike. Well, no, wait a minute. If you, if you, I'm going to put it right this way. If you walk into your house and you leave something really important in your car, I don't care, maybe, maybe a whole bunch of money or something. Well, you how, leave, about, how, how about all, all, all your family's Christmas presents? You, right, you yeah. come out of the house. You right. come out of the house and say, well, don't take that. That's fine. I flip you the birdie and say, ha, I don't care. You can't shoot me and walk off. Well, you realize none of that happened the way that no, you just... No, I'm just saying this is what you're going to see now. No, you're not. Yes, you are. No, you're not. I, I will bet you, Mike, I will bet you <laughs> that uh, that you, uh, there's going to be a lot fewer people walking into garages or into homes. There's going to be a lot more circumspect after what happened. I, and and no. I know it's a terrible example, but uh, I, I, I would bet you that the incidence of burglaries has gone down. I, I'll have to check and see, but that would be my guess. Yeah, but that would be your guess, but legally you cannot protect your property from somebody stealing it. Yes, and you can. You can protect paper? your property. Yeah, but no, there are can't. steps that you, you need to do. There are steps you need to take as a responsible property owner in protecting your property, steps that Marcus Karma You're failed to take. not in danger. And look, you just had Gary Marvin on. I'd have to come after you. But if I'm stealing your stuff, you can say, I can flip you to birdie and walk off and there ain't a dang thing you can do about it. You have to call the police and wait for them to show up, which could be anywhere from five to a half an hour. Well, how, so, how, how, about, how about if I have my weapon and I hold the man at bay? You and can't say, hold him at bay because you have to sh- be able to shoot him. And if you can't shoot him, if your life's not in danger, you cannot shoot him unless he's charging you. If he's walking away, you cannot shoot him. There is no way in heck you can shoot him if he's walking away with your material. Well, I, then... I, I, I'll bet you on that one. All right, That's Mike. That's all I got to say. We just need a new T-shirt that says paper or plastic because you're coming out the garage. All right. Thanks for the right. call. We're up. We're way past the break. Tyler, if you'll hang on a second, we have two lines open, 721-1290. I, I don't know. If you agree with Mike that this is going to cause more crime, or if you disagree, or if you have other questions or comments about the karma trial, give us a call at 721-1290. Talk back. Thursday, December the 18th, it's the uh, day following the uh, guilty verdict to the Marcus Karma trial, deliberate homicide. So uh, Gary Marbot was with us for a while, but he had to go. Uh, we have a Facebook comment. That's John. right. G. Anderson says, as Marbot indicated, a person is to be in a defensive posture when such a situation unfolds. Protecting your defensive position is paramount. Quote, standing your ground, end quote, is a defensive, not aggressive action, in my opinion. Okay. That's good. Tyler on the line. Tyler, thanks for holding. Go ahead, sir. I. So, uh, I spend a lot of time in gun stores and um, hunting stores, and the the uh, feeling of the people that I've talked with about this, um, there are a lot of people that are on my side that say that this guy was justified, and the only fact they have to back that up is the fact that this guy was in his house. And... Um, there are also a lot of people out there that have analyzed the case and analyzed this guy's demeanor and have come to a different conclusion that this guy, uh, he baited him. Uh, and he did what he could to inflict his own sort of justice on being after being robbed. Uh, He'd been robbed twice, twice before, right. Twice before. So... Uh, there are a lot of people out there that have different opinions. Oh yeah, there's but, certainly but there's you, certainly a you, you know exactly. what you, you so, know what you know, you know it's interesting, Tyler. In in the testimony that again, I I sat through a lot of testimony, and uh, and if somebody knows better, please correct me. But when Janelle Flager was uh, was testifying, she said Marcus told me, "Let's just close up the garage, close up the house, lock up everything tight as a drum." And we won't have to worry about it anymore, mm-hmm. you know. And, and I'm thinking, well, why that's, didn't they that, do that? That that sounds like a reasonable thing to do. If you if you're Janelle, being robbed, Janelle, why didn't we do that? Well, if 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 if, if we're being robbed because our garage door is open, let's close the garage door and keep yeah. it locked and keep the cars locked. And 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 if there are people who want to break in and steal, the first thing they find is a locked door. Guess where they go? They're not going to sit around and monkey around with your locked door. They're going to the next place. Exactly. So, anyway. And, and, and one other thing I'd, I'd like to point out, and, <clears throat> and this is 
this brings concern to me. This is the main thing that I really have uh, gives me pause. That this guy openly admitted that he was he had intent to kill kids in a hairdressing place. Yeah. With multiple witnesses, and not one single person took him serious enough to call the cops. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Now, that what what does that say for this kind of society that that somebody can actually openly admit full intent to do something like that in a barber shop, and n- no action is taken? Well, actually, I believe some the police had been called on karma before, if I'm not mistaken. For for prior behavior, but not for what he said in that barber shop. Yeah, yeah but I mean, how much do you take that? I mean. The way people I took say the things. Eyewitness testimony at, uh, from what I saw, from what she said on the stand, she didn't even take him serious. Yeah, exactly. Like, that's that's exactly how I would have taken it. If someone said that to me, <laughs> no, she, it's just uh, and, and 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 the intimation was as when when the defense did the cross examination, they're just blowing off steam. Right, right. They're just blowing off steam. They're just they're they're frustrated. They're angry. They're blowing off steam. You didn't think you meant anything by it, that sort of thing. Like, I hear people yell stupid, crazy stuff on the radio every single day. Well, <laughs> and I, well, <laughs> well now, now, hold on a second. Now, just when, when I'll bet this has happened when you're driving and somebody cuts you off, you run, run, run. And, and so, so am I going to call a cop because somebody said you're a, a, a whatever, yeah. whatever kind of deleted explosive you want to use? Right. Uh, I think there's uh, a far cry between road rage and anger in an empty car and openly admitting to it intent for murder in a barbershop. Yeah, but that intent, it only means something retroactively. It only means something because he actually killed a kid. Right. I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure that somebody else sitting in that barbershop heard that and, and tuned into that conversation. But I, I just find it hard that nobody took him, hard to believe that nobody took him serious enough to at least, you know, talk to him outside. Hey, man, are you doing all right? You know, something. I would have. Yeah. I would not have approached Marcus Karma. <laughs> hey, listen, we, uh, Tyler, we got to run. Thanks for the Thank call. You. And uh, Pascal and Emmett, we're going to get you guys on here in a moment. We have a one-minute break, and we have one line. Whoop, there it goes. Seven, <laughs> seven, we get to spend all day talking about this. We, we will be right back. Got my Hall and Oates uh, fix in here for the uh, for the day. That's for sure. Okay, so uh, you have another Facebook comment. Yeah, Gloria says based on the facts disclosed, Karma obviously wanted to kill someone. His wife is complicit in this entrapment and homicide, and should be held accountable. Karma used drugs, and his previous behavior speaks volumes about the dangers of drugs. We must push for stronger legislation to stop the use of recreational drugs. I feel sorry and concerns for their baby. All right, let's get uh, Pascal on the line. Hi, Pascal. Good morning, sir. Hey, good morning, guys. Hey, uh, i got a, a couple of things here real quick. I realize you're running out of time here. What was the... Uh, Peter, you were there a lot for the trial. Yes, sir. Uh, and I've got, again, i got two questions, so don't forget. All right. What was the thing that kind of tipped it over, you think? I think the thing that tipped it over was, was the intent. The, 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 there had to be deliberate intent uh, 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 premeditation and intent, uh, and and the fact that he fired four four times uh, in blindly into a house that actually put his own family in danger, um, and and one one of the big things was fired three times and then there was a pause, and then there was a fourth shot, and the prosecution intimated that he was aiming with that last shot as a kill shot. Well, okay. I, I, from from, right. wa- from can, watching it, I, I'll tell you when it shifted for me because I I got to hear everything like after you guys. Sure, but I yeah. I got to think about it a little bit, <laughs> and for me, everything shifted when the hairdressers took the stand, because that showed that there was forethought, and that there was knowledge of the amount of threat that was uh, coming yeah, into there, that garage. There was intent. Well, yeah, right. Okay. Look, I realize again time's running away, but isn't always forethought involved? The, the, uh, the conditions of what you do with the forethought may be different in every situation. But there's always forethought involved if you're going to defend your home if you had previous encounters in the past. So the, the difference here is what were you going to do with the forethought? Well, well, that, gonna, right. In his testimony to the hairdressers, he said, I'm going to kill those kids. Well, okay, but and that's, the, the, that's what I was alluding to. Okay, but the baiting issue is somewhat hypocritical. Police officers and justice system bait people all the time. Whether they put a decoy out there to bait a, a hunter to shoot at it, or they go on, on, on a computer. Yeah, they call it entrapment, right. 
Yeah, but, uh, but they don't that, that, shoot the people was, they interact with. That was, that was disingenuous on the prosecution side because the justice system bait people all the time. And uh, but, what I see here is we're seeing a higher standard now for common citizens to defend themselves, almost to the level of a police officer. Okay, so you know, Pascal, what got to be a professional now? Okay, what what what's what's your second point, real quick? Well, the second point is I don't agree with Mayor uh, Mar- Marbet that jury is. Just, I do agree historically that they can discern and differ the facts from fiction, but that's no longer the case today. We've got so many juries who convict, and we have innocent projects who find people who are convicted by juries. So no, it's not the case anymore. A lot of juries go on exactly what the judge tells them. They don't go according to really the facts. We don't know what the judge did in this case to really hamstring the defense. All right. Well, Pascal, thanks for the call, sir. All right. Have a good one. Emmett, you're on TalkBack. Go ahead. Well, <coughs> thanks for taking my call. I call, I called in a bit late because I was asleep, but I really agree with Pascal's call that he just you just had on. That was absolutely spot on. But I do have a question about the trial. Was it proven by the prosecution that karma did bait and lure the kids in with um, false goods or whatever to lure them in? That was that was part of the argument. A part of the closing argument was that the garage door was open. There was a purse there uh, that uh, that uh, uh, that Janelle Flager had said that they, they had used as bait. She had told the neighbors uh, that yes, he's going to come back because we are going to bait him. Okay. That really does change a lot to, for me, then. That's fascinating. I just have mixed feelings. I do believe, as Pascal said, it's getting so hard to defend yourself. And I don't believe in baiting and everything, but I do believe in the castle doctrine. Of, and I've, it saved my life. And I've had, you know, property. And I, and as a home, I'm not a homeowner, but I, I, maybe the law should be amended that you should be able to defend your private well, property. A, a counter case. Look at the Fox Club shooting. Uh-huh. Okay, in this case, very big difference. The guy True. knows that he's threatened. The other guy is attacking his face mm-hmm. and is coming back to attack again. Right. He can see his target. He shoots his target. Mm-hmm. He and does I not go to. He does not. He has not found. He has not and, found and, guilty. And, and 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 let me tell you the difference between these two. Emmett, I'm going to let you go. The difference between those two cases. Okay. In in my view, one difference. Michael Gordon, who was the man who was involved in the Fox Club shooting. From the moment he entered the uh, coroner's inquest until the moment he left, he was weeping uncontrollably. Mm. He was remorseful over what he had done. He felt absolutely horrible. He felt he kept saying over and over again, it's the only thing I could do. It was the only thing I could do uh, to, to save my life. I thought he was going to kill me. Okay, And so I think the, the coroner's jury took that into, in, into account, saying it was justified shooting. During the, during the karma trial, Mr. Karma never took the stand. So... We didn't have the opportunity to hear him, his side of the story. I, I was a little disappointed. That in was that. his team's defense. I, I, I guess so. That that, that was part Their of their decision. The strategy. Right. Let's go to try to get another call in. Uh, a couple of calls if we can. Bill, good morning. You're on Talkback. Hi. Good morning. I'll make this real quick. You know, I I'm not an expert about this case. I heard it on the news, read it in the paper. My opinion is the guy is legally right but morally wrong. And those two, uh, morally and ethical and legal, never coincide very often. Well, right. why, why do you think he's legally right? I just do not see The guy see was that. in his garage. Doesn't that doesn't matter. give you the, the right to kill him. The guy was in his garage to commit a crime. It was, it was an occupied structure, that's true. So, but, right but we there. Just had, I we, mean, if, we the just, guy, if the kid was not hmm. committing a crime, he'd be, he'd be still alive. It, we, we just had Gary Marbid on just a few minutes ago, the guy that drafted the changes to the law. And he yep. said... To use lethal force, you do have to meet some certain requirements. And yep. some of those revol- invo- revolve around being able to see your target, know that that target's a threat. And whatever their intent may be. Well, how about when you can't see your target and you're threatened? Well, that's I've a good out, question. You know, I've been out in the woods, and I've had a grizzly bear where I couldn't see it, and it was about 30 yards from me. So did you shoot blindly into the dark? I shot... No, you didn't shoot blindly into, into the, the dark. Ground, so... Hey, you know what? I'm, I'm so sorry, Bill. We're completely out of time, but thanks for your call. And we might pick this up again tomorrow. I don't know. So anyway, uh, that's going to do it. So tomorrow, it's Friday. Tomorrow, we'll have some open phones, and uh, we'll go out of the year and greet Christmas and the New Year yes, uh, because with more talkbacks. We're taking year. the following two weeks off. <laughs> don't be scared.